Welcome to Broad Eye, the podcast that explores knowledge gaps in ophthalmology and eye care. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. My name is Sean Maloney, and today I am speaking with Dr. Joel Schumann. Dr. Schumann is a professor and vice chair for research in the Department of Ophthalmology at NY Langone Health and the Grossman School of Medicine. Dr. Schumann, welcome to the show. Thanks so much, Sean. I really appreciate you having me on. Uh, the pleasure is mine. So as I was mentioning to you before we were uh, recording, um, I'm really happy to have you in the hot seat now <laughs> for the next <laughs> you know, 30, 45 minutes, whatever it may be, because I do have a lot of questions um, and uh, I want to see some information. But I was hoping maybe we could start with just uh, you know, a high-level question about ophthalmology and, and maybe glaucoma as well. And what led you down the path uh, of wanting to, you know, get into the field of ophthalmology and, you know, and also why glaucoma? Right. Yeah. So it's interesting. When I was um, growing up, uh, I wanted to be a chemist. I I was just interested in, you know, what made up the world. And I had a chemistry set like other geeky, nerdy kids, I guess. Uh, And uh, I really enjoyed playing with the uh, chemistry set and learning about uh, elements and molecules. And, And so I was planning on being a chemist. And then when I was 12, I can remember uh, my, uh, my dad uh, coming into my room and, and showing me an article that was in the New York Times. And it was about uh, PhDs uh, driving cabs. And he said that um, I, needed to, uh, I, I needed to realign my goals and, and that I should think about other things that I might want to do. But I really liked you know, this idea of, uh, of being a, a chemist. And so I decided after that, uh, that I would, okay, I'll, I'll be, I'll be a doctor, an MD, uh, and then maybe I can, you know, pursue other things, but I, I didn't have even that depth of thought at the time since I was 12 and in college. So this is, uh, five or six years later, I studied, um, visual perception. At the time, it was uh, psychology. Now it would be neuroscience, and I was interested in um, how you see what you see. So um, there was uh, some really neat stuff um, uh, about perception and how you perceive, and uh, a lot of uh, kind of fun things um, having to do with optical illusions and um, you know why they're illusions, how they are constructed uh, in your brain. And I, I really uh, enjoyed that. I was at, um, at Columbia University at the time. And during the summers in college or during one of the summers, um, I spent time at uh, Montefiore Hospital, Albert Einstein. Uh, and I uh, worked uh, in an ophthalmology lab. And that was something that introduced me to, uh, to the eye and eye research beyond the perceptual aspect. And when I went to medical school, I, I was still very interested in perception. And, and at the time, I actually thought about becoming a neurosurgeon. Uh, but then I realized that, you know, there were a lot of people that you can't really help uh, as a neurosurgeon. And um, I was still primarily interested in, in visual perception. And I, I ended up uh, choosing ophthalmology. I had had some exposure to ophthalmology um, through my brother, who's an ophthalmologist, and um, I pursued training in ophthalmology. And I, I haven't uh, looked back since. Oh, and that's fair. So, why is it glaucoma? I, I, I mean, I guess a lot of ophthalmologists will, you know, subspecialize, and I think you do more than glaucoma. But your background really seems to focus on glaucoma, including. Um, some of the research, which I'll talk about shortly, but maybe why glaucoma? Yeah, you know, when I was in um, my residency training, I, I thought about, you know, what, what was interesting to me and also um, in what fields would I be able to get a job? Uh, and I, uh, I was in Virginia um, and there was only uh, one uh, fellowship trained glaucoma specialist in Virginia at the time. This was in the mid 80s. 
And I, I realized uh, that at the time, glaucoma was really an underserved specialty and area within ophthalmology. And there were also a tremendous number of unanswered questions. There was just so much that we didn't know about glaucoma. And then on top of that, the uh, diagnosis of the disease was completely subjective. It was glaucoma because it looks like glaucoma and it fits, you know, certain characteristics. And, and to some extent that that's still true, actually, you know, there's no blood test you can do to determine whether or not somebody has glaucoma. It is still a, a clinical diagnosis, but now we have some objective quantitative uh, ways of um, uh, making that assessment more precisely. So glaucoma was really interesting. There were jobs available. I, I thought it was uh, an area that I could make a contribution in uh, because there was so much that was unknown um, and that it would be um, it, it would be something that I might uh, enjoy working on. Oh, well, that's fair. So you've been in the, the research side as well for quite some time. And, um, you know, that's about, I'd say, two decades now. I think since it was 2000, 2001, I think there was a paper that you were a part of um, that was looking at a molecular marker of glaucoma. Um, I think it was ELAM-1, if I remember from my notes <laughs> correctly. Can you just talk a little bit about uh, maybe that research uh, and what that maybe meant to you and to the, to the field at that time? And, uh, and if that has kicked off um, any, any other initiatives, I guess, uh, since then? Yeah, so um, a good memory. <laughs> I'm, I'm glad that, uh, that there's one other person, at least, who saw that. Um, <laughs> I'm they, sure there's yeah. a few. It was in Nature Medicine, so I'm sure there's, been yeah, a, there, yeah. there's at least two or three others that yeah. have seen that, that paper. <laughs> um, yeah, so uh, that grew out of a, a talk that I heard uh, when I was uh, actually, it was when I was a fellow, and I was at uh, a meeting of the American Uveitis Society. I was very interested in uveitis at the time, another field where there's, uh, there's a lot that's unknown. And there was somebody who was talking about um, cell surface molecules and cell adhesion uh, molecules. And I was uh, very interested in aqueous outflow, uh, how fluid gets from inside the eye back into the bloodstream. And I, I, I thought that there may be some role that uh, these um, cell surface molecules uh, played in regulating uh, aqueous outflow. And I, I started to do some research on this. Um, it, it started actually with a, um, a patient who had leukemic glaucoma. And we looked at the molecular markers on the uh, leukemic cells and, and in the outflow pathway. And we figured out that the problem wasn't the, that the cells would get stuck because of their shape or deformability, but rather because of um, stickiness. Uh, and that ended up causing the um, uh, pressure to go up in, in people who had uh, leukemic infiltrates. Uh, this was uh, chronic lymphocytic leukemia um, in the eye. And from there, we looked at other uh, cell surface molecules um, and uh, we found that there were certain uh, molecules that were expressed uh, in the aqueous outflow pathway and in particular parts of the aqueous outflow pathway preferentially. And then we looked at healthy eyes. Uh, well, they weren't healthy anymore because they were cadaverized, but um, they were normal uh, and compared that to eyes that had had glaucoma. And we found that there were certain differences uh, between the two. And that, that one difference that um, was consistent was that uh, in eyes with glaucoma, there was this molecule that was um, being made all the time, what's called constitutively. Uh, and this molecule uh, was also made in other diseases. Uh, and it, it, it's a molecule that the body makes as a response to stress, but if uh, the cell is diseased or stressed enough, it becomes part of the regular production machinery of the, of the cell. And, and so it's expressed all the time instead of just in response to stress. And in that case, it becomes part of the disease process itself. So in diseases like atherosclerosis or pulmonary hypertension, you have this molecule, um, ELAM, uh, or e-selectin uh, 
um, that's made that uh, is a stress response, but then becomes a part of the disease process. And we found the same uh, molecule in um, the aqueous outflow pathway of uh, people with, with high pressure glaucoma. And, and so that was the first molecular marker for glaucoma. Unfortunately, you know, since it's in the aqueous outflow pathway to get to it, it requires uh, surgery. Um, and if you're doing that kind of surgery, you pretty much know that the patient has glaucoma uh, to start off with. It, it hasn't really proved uh, to be a good therapeutic target uh, at this point either, but it is, uh, it is a marker. But what's interesting I find is that, okay, so when, I guess my first question here, uh, maybe, you know, maybe you don't, but is there any correlation between cardiovascular disease, atherosclerosis, and glaucoma incidence? And if so, are these markers like ELAM reselectin potentially what underpin this, I guess this, this I don't want to call it a coincidence, but the, the fact that both these might occur together? So um, the outflow pathway is a, it's a vascular pathway. Um, the, uh, the fluid goes uh, from inside the eye through this kind of filtering meshwork uh, called the trabecular meshwork um, into a vessel called Schlem Canal. And, and that's probably a modified lymphatic um, vessel. And, and then from there, it goes into collector channels, which lead to the bloodstream. And so there may be uh, some similarities um, uh, between you know, cardiovascular diseases and glaucoma, but there's not an association per se between people who have cardiovascular disease and people who have glaucoma. Um, so it's not that kind of a relationship. Uh, it's, I, I think at more, at a, on a more fundamental level, there are similarities, but not on a clinical uh, disease basis uh, level. I think that it's part of a, a larger picture by, by it. I mean, the, that ELAM is produced in, in this way that there's a derangement of the cells so that it's producing this substance, not as a stress response, but all the time. And, and that, that has to do with the, uh, with the stress response itself. So the, the concept that glaucoma or high pressure uh, can be a stressor that, uh, you can have um, oxidative damage to the outflow pathway that can act as a stressor uh, to the tissue. And then that generates this tissue-specific stress response that results in the production of uh, ELAM and other, uh, other molecules. So it, it's, it's part of this bigger picture and part of the pathway, but it's, it's certainly not the whole story. Oh, and that's fair. Thanks for that, that, uh, that explanation. Um, I want to dive into a, a story for which you are um, professionally well known. Um, but before I do, I was hoping maybe you could give a high level overview of what OCT is um, and what its function is and you know, why clinicians use OCT. Sure. Yeah. Um, so OCT is optical coherence tomography. And it's a, it's a very simple technology uh, at, at its um, core, uh, which is interferometry. And interferometry has been around for a long time. Uh, it's a Michelson type interferometer in the, the first iteration uh, that, um, that was invented. Uh, and uh, it, it was, um, it, it's basically in this first iteration, um, which is called time domain OCT, that you have a light uh, that has many different wavelengths um, and that that light is um, shined, shown um, on a, an object, a sample of the eye. Um, and it's also going to uh, something that is a known distance away, um, in this case, a mirror. Uh, and so the light goes to the mirror and to the eye, and then it is reflected back. And those two beams, the beam from the mirror and the beam from the eye, are uh, meet at a uh, photo detector, something that senses the light. And um, the mirror is, as I said, it, it's a known distance from the light source. The eye is 
the same distance, um, uh, depending on where in the eye that uh, the light is being reflected from. And the mirror then is moved back and forth in, uh, in a rapid fashion so that it's measuring the reflections of the light coming back from the eye throughout the path of that light. Uh, so it, it's, it's measuring each kind of level, each distance, each layer uh, or portion of the layer separately. Uh, and the way that it does that is that the light has many wavelengths and you only have, because of that, you only have a signal when uh, the, um, the time that it takes for the light to go from the source to the mirror, to the photo detector, and from the source to the specific layer of the eye back to the photo detector, when that time of, of flight of the light is equal, you get a signal. And when it's not exactly equal, you don't. You, there's something called destructive interference that, that eliminates the signal at all but that specific point. And that way, uh, we can have a very high resolution signal for, you know, how much reflection you get at a certain point in space. I guess that's kind of a long-winded definition. But the bottom line is that we can measure uh, the uh, distances that the lights traveled uh, very precisely. And that way, you can tell, you know, how much reflection you have and where it is very specifically um, at every point along the scan. And then by taking sequential scans, uh, you know, kind of one next to the other, you can build up this um, series of lines that create a map. Um, and that allows us to actually see the tissue in cross section um, in with very high detail. And that is used in order to uh, tell whether or not there's um, abnormality or disease in the part of the eye that you're looking at. So in this case, uh, we're talking about retina or cornea. So the retina, the nerve tissue in the back of the eye that you see with, can then be visualized. The normal thickness of that tissue is only about a third of a millimeter. And we can see all of the different or many different layers uh, within the retina uh, with uh, great accuracy and precision. And, and that allows us to detect disease. Uh, it allows us to track disease, uh, to see if somebody's getting worse or getting better. And uh, it's all done using this interfer interferometric uh, technique. One of the exciting things about OCT is that it's an objective quantitative way of, of interrogating, of assessing um, the tissue. And so this tissue, which in, in the past, 30 years ago, we were only able to look at and make interpretations of qualitatively. Now we can use a device um, to capture an image um, and to capture images, not just, you know, like a, a photograph where uh, you don't have the depth information, but rather to have all of the depth information. And initially it was just cross-sectionally. And then uh, more recently we can capture this in 3D and uh, be able to analyze that, um, that image and have very uh, useful data, useful information for assessing the, the patient and determining whether there's disease, what kind of disease, how bad it is. And in people who, you know, we know have disease and we're following to be able to tell whether or not the disease is getting better or worse. So OCT initially started out just as a way of measuring, you know, the, the reflection from tissue surfaces um, along, you know, a, a single a single line, a, a, a single uh, point scan. And then uh, it grew to be uh, something that could give us a cross-sectional image and then to something that can give us three-dimensional images. 
And that, that latter advance um, has to do with how quickly uh, we're able to capture the information uh, with OCT. So by scanning faster, we can gather enough information so that we can create a 3D map instead of just a, a 2D cross-sectional map. No, that's a fantastic overview. Um, I remember the first time I actually had OCT performed on me, I guess, for lack of a better way to say it. It was when I was at the uh, National Institute. I was there for some genetic testing, actually, uh, for my own eye condition. And one thing that amazed me was just actually how quick the procedure was. You know, the way you, you describe it, um, I, you can envision in your mind that this could be, you know, a long process, you know, layer uh, you're trying to, you know, get multiple scans and overlay these scans, et cetera. But it's actually, a, you know, a, a, a quite a quick procedure. Are the, are the newer ones as quick when you're looking at trying to get 3D um, images as well, like the actual procedures for the patient, they, as quick yeah. as they used to be? Yeah. Yeah. So it's amazingly fast. Um, it used to be in the first clinical uh, OCTs. Um, so we're talking about the... Um, the early 90s, it took um, <clears throat> two and a half seconds to do 100 uh, points, 100 A scans, they're called. So an A scan is a, just a single scan, like if you took a laser pointer and pointed it at something, that you can think of that line uh, from the laser pointer to wherever it's reflecting from as an A scan. And then by putting a series of those A scans together, you, you create what's called a B scan, which gives you that cross-sectional image. Um, so a hundred of those A scans uh, took two and a half seconds uh, to acquire. Um, now, uh, commercial OCTs uh, can acquire a uh, hundred thousand A scans in a second. And there are even uh, commercial machines that can acquire 200,000 or more than 200,000 uh, A scans in a second. So they're much, much faster <laughs> than they were uh, originally. And, and that has to do with the, how the technology has evolved um, and how the interferometer uh, is constructed. Uh, it's, it's a little bit different than the original, which was as I said, called time domain, because you had a mirror that was moving back and forth in time. And now the mirror is um, stationary and you're measuring all of the wavelengths of the light coming back uh, all at once. And the wavelength of the light is telling us where in space it's being reflected from instead of the moving mirror. Uh, and that allows the um, technology to be much, much faster. Uh, and so that's called Fourier domain OCT or spectral domain uh, OCT. The name's not important, but what, what's important is that we can acquire the same information, actually better information, uh, very, very rapidly now, whereas it took um, a, a longer time in the, in the old days. In the old days, but it wasn't that, it wasn't that <laughs> long ago. Um, <laughs> So, well, okay, let's, let's dial this back to the old days then, as, as, you've, as you've framed it. Um, you know, you talk about OCT with more depth of knowledge and uh, passion than anybody I think I've ever heard speak about OCT. Uh, I think part of that stems from the fact that you are credited as one of the people who helped develop the technology. Um, so maybe we can just, uh, if you could walk us through that journey, I guess, um, you know, how did the whole idea come about um, you know what was your team like because it seems like there's a lot of engineering there's a lot of uh, optics uh, physics involved in all this um, and maybe just what that uh, what that whole journey <laughs> journey looked like from start to finish I know it could probably be a four hour a four hour answer but uh, I'll, I'll leave that in your hands to see what you can do with it <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> okay so I was uh, I was really fortunate um, to become involved uh, and become part of the team that invented OCT. And uh, so to tell the story, I, I need to go back to when I was uh, a fellow. Um, so for those who are listening, a, a fellow is someone who's completed their uh, medical school training 
uh, and completed their residency training. Residency is where we uh, specialize, where we uh, uh, learn to take care of whatever aspect of a person's health um, that we've uh, chosen as, as our particular field. And then after you've, you've specialized in an area, you can subspecialize in a focused uh, portion of that area. Uh, and so in ophthalmology, uh, we do our uh, medical school training, and then we do a residency in ophthalmology. There's actually an internship year before that uh, that's more, more general medicine. And then uh, we hone in on, um, on the eye uh, for three years. And uh, then many people, about half the people, um, will do fellowship training uh, to specialize in a certain thing like uh, retina or cornea or glaucoma or uh, pediatric ophthalmology, neuro-ophthalmology, et cetera. Um, so there are a lot of different areas within ophthalmology, even though the eye is a small organ, that, that people specialize in. So I decided that I, I was interested in glaucoma, as we talked about before. So I did a glaucoma fellowship, and I was a fellow um, at uh, Mass Eye and Ear. Uh, and Mass Eye and Ear is part of Harvard and has affiliations, um, you know, throughout the uh, the region in, in Boston. And and one of those um, relationships uh, is with uh, MIT, Massachusetts Institute of Technology. I was working uh, in a laboratory focused on uh, development of uh, new lasers and laser applications. And I, uh, I heard about a project uh, that was uh, going on in the lab, not, not one that I was involved in. And that project was to measure the thickness of the cornea uh, for a new procedure called laser refractive surgery. And so this is in the late 80s, uh, early 90s. And uh, this technology uh, actually was uh, failing. And it was failing not because it didn't work, um, but because it wasn't fast enough. And that lack of speed meant that it wouldn't be a good, uh, that, that measuring the thickness of the cornea for laser refractive surgery wouldn't be a good application for this technology. And you could do laser refractive surgery without knowing the, the thickness of the cornea in real time because you know exactly how much tissue the laser takes off um, with every pulse. And so it wasn't really a good application for the technology for that reason as well. But I realized that the wavelength uh, of that, um, the the technology that was measuring the tissue thickness would not only be good for the front of the eye, but could be used in the back of the eye uh, so that you could measure the retina, um, not just the cornea. And so I asked the uh, person who was the head of the uh, laser lab at uh, Mass Eye and Ear, Carmen Pliofito, if it would be okay uh, for me to go over uh, and speak with his uh, collaborator um, at MIT, Jim Fujimoto. And we had a conversation and, and Corman uh, gave me permission to uh, uh, go over and, and see, uh, see Jim and his lab. So that was when I first met uh, Jim Fujimoto, uh, who was head of the high-speed laser lab at, um, at MIT. Uh, and uh, he, um, was working on this new technology that, that he was developing called optical coherence domain reflectometry, which is what eventually became optical coherence tomography. And uh, he had a, uh, a student who was what's called a health sciences technology or, M or um, HST uh, student who does a combined MD and PhD at uh, Harvard and MIT, and that student's name was David Huang. Uh, and so uh, I met Jim and I met David Huang, uh, and um, I brought over a, a bag of calf eyes. And we, um, 
we were going to use those camp eyes in order to see whether or not we would be able to uh, get a signal uh, using the OCDR from the retina in the calf eyes. Uh, so I, I, I took uh, the calf eyes and I, I cut them in half uh, so that I would be able to uh, have the retina uh, exposed to the OCDR beam. We wanted to make it as easy as possible because this was a proof of principle. And we, um, we put the uh, calf eye underneath the beam. At that time, it was being delivered uh, vertically. Uh, and, um, and so the calf eye was in a little cup, sort of, uh, and we put it under the beam and then um, went off to get some Diet Cokes because it took a long time to get, uh, to get a signal because the scan took a long time. And uh, so we, uh, we came back and, and uh, there was a signal. We, we knew then that we would be able to um, uh, get a signal from the retina. Um, and so we had proof of principle, uh, and then there was, you know, a lot of, um, uh, sweat work to get from that point to, uh, being able to, um, uh, deliver this in a, a living eye. But before that happened, uh, before, before it went from OCDR to OCT, David Wong, uh, had the insight that if you took a series of these A scans, these uh, kind of single line scans, that you could create an image. Uh, and uh, before all you had, you know, was a, um, you'd have a curve showing the spikes uh, from the different interfaces in the tissue. Um, but when you have a series of those uh, side by side, um, you can use that information to, um, to create uh, an image like you're, you know, taking a picture of a cross section. That is the the way that that came about was from the analogy um, to ultrasound. Uh, so if you're looking at an ultrasound, a lot of us, a lot of people have seen, you know, like ultrasounds of babies um, in their their mother's stomach. So you're seeing it in cross section, and the reason you can see it is that there are a series of uh, of linear scans, of A scans that are put together to create that image um, very, very quickly. And so uh, David realized you could do the same thing with this beam uh, and create uh, what we call the B scan, uh, which is what they call it in uh, ultrasound as well. And that's the cross-sectional uh, image. And that um, was a game changer because it, it made it very easy to interpret um, what the OCT was telling us uh, by having an image as opposed to just a series of spikes. And that, uh, so that transformed OCDR uh, into OCT because now it's tomography. And it took um, a couple of years from that time uh, to uh, delivering the, the information, the, you know, to, to being able to acquire OCTs um, in living eyes. Uh, we also looked at human cadaver eyes. Um, and there were a number of uh, graduate students who, had, who were rotating through Jim Fujimoto's lab at the time. And there was a physicist, Charles Lin, uh, from the laser lab at Mass Ioneer, from Carmen Fido's lab. And there was also Eric Swanson, um, who built the the first uh, OCT device um, that that be, you know was transformed into the commercial technology, and so he built what's called the breadboard, uh, which is that that first uh, that first iteration of the uh, of the OCT technology, um, and that went through a number of iterations certainly before it could be used um, in vivo in in, in living things. And there were, um, the, there were studies in uh, human cadaver eyes, there were studies in animal eyes. Um, and uh, the, the work it, it led up to um, a technology that could be used in living human eyes. And so when we had that, <clears throat> that first scan in a, a living eye that was uh, 
also a transformative moment. But even before then, when we had the first OCT, you know, having gone from a series of spikes to an actual image uh, that was a cross section of the retina, uh, that was uh, an incredible moment. Uh, and, you know, I, I, I remember that very clearly. Um, and so I, I think that uh, one of the things that, that made uh, the process of invention of the technology so special and exciting um, was that it really took a team and people with different skill sets uh, and uh, you know different ways of looking at things uh, to um, create this uh, technology that has had an impact on um, how patients are taken care of. It also has broader applications um, outside of ophthalmology and outside of medicine, but the work was in the eye initially because the eye is accessible. It's optically clear. <clears throat> really, you know, when you're, you're looking at the retina, you're looking at part of the brain. Uh, and so being able to do that, um, you know, non-invasively and without uh, any physical contact, you know, was made, made the eye a very attractive uh, first target. The, uh, the team, you know, consisted of uh, Jim Fujimoto, uh, an engineer in, you know, and it was in his lab really that, uh, that OCT was born. And, uh, you know, Carm Plifito, who's a clinician, uh, myself, I'm also a clinician. Uh, Charles Lin, a physicist, um, David Wong, who is a, uh, a clinician um, and an engineer, is a PhD and an MD, um, and also Eric Swanson, uh, an engineer. Eric was at MIT Lincoln Lab, and um, you know his uh, his skills in constructing the device were critical, central to um, to its development. And all of us really contributed uh, in our own ways uh, to um, to the invention of this technology. That's an amazing story. I love that story. And the, uh, you know, one thing I really like about it um, and resonates with me right now and in, in what I'm doing, but I won't get into that, is, um, you know, the cross-disciplinary nature of the invention, right? It's not just one lone genius, Joel Schumann, sitting there one day and saying, aha, I'm going to do this. And then, you know, working tirelessly and making it all happen. It's uh, you know, it's a lot of brilliant minds coming together and, and uh, contributing different points of view and different areas of expertise. Um, and I'm sure, you know, you were as amazed by, um, you know, uh, Jim Fujimoto's lab and, and what they were doing as they were, you know, with your background and expertise as well. So, uh, no, that's a really uh, great story. And I think that that type of collaboration um, is at the heart of a lot of um, innovation in general in medicine. Um, I think that people uh, who aren't in that space don't necessarily recognize just how, you know the importance of that collaboration between the you know the engineering side as well as the uh, people doing uh, the medicine side as well. So it's uh, no, I love that story. That's <laughs> that's great. I don't know if there's I don't know if that story has ever been told in that depth in audio format has it been or in video format from from your mouth <laughs> uh no no that's this is it there you go this is <laughs> you're gonna you're gonna you're gonna skyrocket the podcast the popularity here of <laughs> this is gonna be a first uh, first uh, tell all um no this is this is great um so i guess my next question on this is after being part of something that has you know fundamentally um, been a leap forward in ophthalmology. Um, and like you said, it, it bleeds over into other uh, domains outside of ophthalmology medicine. After being part of something like that and, and that, you know, gratification, satisfaction that, you know, you were able to contribute to, uh, to something uh, that, that's significant. What drives you to keep doing what you're doing? Because you haven't stopped research uh, from my understanding and my in my research into to you and what you do um, so maybe if you could just comment on you know what is what keeps you looking for um, you know looking to innovate um, and continue research and maybe what's some of the 
areas uh, focus for you are right now? So, you know, it, it's, it's curiosity. Um, and one of the things that um, I always uh, stress to, uh, to students, to residents, fellows, is, is, is to always uh, be, be curious and uh, not accept the status quo uh, you know, and, and kind of think through things so that you understand um, as best as you can how they're happening, you know, why things are happening. The how and why are really important questions. And, you know, to some extent, you know, engineering and science comes together there because in general, the scientists are asking why and the engineers are asking how. And, and together you can uh, figure stuff out and uh, create ways uh, to, uh, to investigate them and to uh, to bring solutions uh, back uh, to um, in in the case of medicine and and what I do back to the clinic back to patients. I I think that uh, curiosity uh, is is probably the main driver and uh, you know a desire to kind of figure things out uh, and um, and uh, create new knowledge uh, make things make things better. The, the work that uh, we've done over the years has, and when I say we, I mean the, the people uh, in my lab uh, and myself, uh, and my lab consists of uh, people with various disciplines, you know, who are, who are doing, uh, oh, engineering, medicine, uh, physics, um, clinical researchers. Uh, there, are, there are so many um, really talented people who have had the, uh, the chance to work with. But I, I, I think that it's a very special opportunity to be able to, to work with, um, with such a great group. And for me, I mean, for me, it's a great opportunity. I, I, I do think that for almost anybody who decides that they want to be a clinician scientist or who, you know, maybe they don't decide, maybe, maybe it's, um, you know, something that, that you can't avoid uh, if you have, uh, if you have that desire, curiosity and want to explore. So for me, it's, it's kind of like that same, you know, kid playing with the chemistry set, but I have a, a couple more skills than I did then. And, uh, you know, I'm able to investigate things in a way that would be productive instead of, you know, only fun. So what we've what we've looked at primarily is how uh, we can create and use technology to better assess the eye and in uh, in general, particularly the retina, but uh, and the optic nerve, but the eye and really the the eye um, because there are other parts of the eye that that we've uh, uh, looked at and found useful information in in terms of assessing glaucoma. So we've been able to, um, to explore uh, and uh, identify certain differences in microstructures of the optic nerve and the lamina carbosa, certain aspects of the retina and particular locations in the retina that are useful for uh, assessing glaucoma. But, and then also in the, in the front of the eye, being able to look at the aqueous outflow system uh, using OCT. So, you know, all of this is objective and, and quantitative, non-contact uh, and quick. And really, you know, in, in the beginning, what fascinated me was, is there a way to take the field from a subjective assessment that you really need an expert to make um, to an objective quantitative assessment that the technology enables almost anybody to make. And that kind of flattens the world uh, in terms of the ability to provide care for, for patients. Uh, and it decreases the variability and the imprecision of, uh, of clinical diagnosis or uh, assessment of, uh, of disease progression. So, so that was kind of the, the fundamental driver. Uh, and it's, it's all a matter of, you know, what do you have inside of you that, that makes you want to do these things? And, and to some extent, uh, I, I think that most people who, who do this kind of work 
in terms of you know being a clinician and being a scientist and uh, maybe being a scientist in general uh, you know it's almost like you don't have a choice you don't feel fulfilled unless you're doing the work and so that uh, so that I think is uh, is what what stimulates the uh, the ongoing um, interest or passion in terms of the actual projects that uh, that we're we're doing now. We've got a few different things going on. So, so one of them is that uh, we're still looking for ways to, I, to detect glaucoma um, as early as possible and to detect glaucoma progression as early as possible. Because the earlier that we can identify the disease or identify that the disease is getting worse, the less aggressively we'll need to treat the patient in order to uh, stop or significantly slow the progress of the disease. The worse the disease is when it's detected, the more intensively you need to, to treat. And so we, we want to try to expose the patient to as little risk as possible to treat um, as, as gently or not have to be invasively aggressive when we're treating somebody with glaucoma. And you can only do that if, uh, if you can catch the disease early or to catch the earliest signs of disease progression. Um, so along those lines, we've been doing clinical studies uh, longitudinally in people for the last uh, 25 years now. Uh, so we've been imaging people. I, I, I've been at three different locations since since OCT was um, introduced commercially, and I have cohorts of uh, patients at each of those sites who continue to be followed. And so we we've analyzed data from long periods of time of follow up, and other other groups uh, are doing that uh, as well. So that's that's one of the uh, areas that uh, that we're uh, continuing to to work in. Another is in terms of you know new iterations of the OCT technology. We've uh, been fortunate to work with Hao Zhang at Northwestern with a version of OCT that uses visible light instead of near infrared light, and that shorter wavelength of light allows us to uh, see greater detail in the retina because. Uh, it uh, has a higher resolution. Uh, there, the technology has a higher resolution than um, near infrared OCT on the order of uh, about one and a half microns. And we can also do oximetry with the visible light OCT so that we can look at the oxygen saturation uh, within the arteries and veins in the eye. And that tells us about tissue function, how much oxygen is the tissue consuming. And we are investigating that as a, as a biomarker, a way of assessing glaucoma. And you can imagine that it, it would be useful for other diseases as well. So that's a, a, you know, a, a new area for this technology. And then we've got you know, any, other, any, any number of other studies that are in progress. But I, I guess the one other major area that we're looking at is the incorporation of adaptive optics into OCT uh, together with our collaborators at Physical Sciences Incorporated, PSI. And that uh, what, what adaptive optics enables us to do is to have higher resolution in what's called the transverse direction. So if you're looking at a photograph, all of it is in the transverse direction. So from side to side and up and down, um, you're looking at kind of a flat view of the uh, uh, of whatever it is the photograph is of. With OCT, you have not only that flat view, but you have all the information behind it uh, so that the information is not all collapsed into a single plane, but you have all of the planes uh, that, you're, that you're looking at independently. And you can look at, all, at it all collapsed into a flat plane, but um, you can also look individually at each plane. And so the, the resolution is higher from side to side and up and down, and not just in depth. OCT gives you that great depth resolution, and then adaptive optics gives you that great side to side resolution. 
and so we're we're using that technology um, in the lamina cribosa and also in various layers of the retina. How do you sleep at night? <laughs> it <laughs> really soundly. Like, yeah, it's, it's either it's you know your brain is exhausted at the end of the day, or I don't know. No, that, I mean this is amazing. I mean it's uh, you know I think um, you know one thing you said, and, and I'll just um, um, follow up maybe with one quick question before we wrap up. But one thing I really like that you said is that how OCT helps provide an object, objective evaluation versus a subjective, and what it really does is um, as a technology helps, I don't say level the playing field, but really level uh, access to um, some of this medical information more so than, you know, was available before where you had to have a, you know, a subject expert uh, on site to be able to, to write their diagnosis and whatnot. So, and I think that technology is going to continue flattening the, the landscape, I guess, for, for people to have access to this type of information, which is something I'm certainly excited about. I think medicine as a whole is uh, starting to experience that. And certainly the eye is an organ that's going to benefit dramatically from uh, advances in technology being as accessible, I guess you could say, as, as it were without any, uh, without being invasive. So, um, and I think it also is a testament to who you are just talking about those benefits, because it's not everybody that's going to, you know, have that uh, global view of, you know, how the technology could you know, really impact so many people and to give people access to, uh, to medical care. So I think that, uh, that's something we haven't gone into and you have more awards than what time will allow us to, to name and titles and whatnot. But, uh, I was thinking we could just wrap up with, if you have any parting thoughts or advice for well, people who listen to this podcast, you have, uh, certainly you have patients, you have medical students and residents, you have people in industry, if you had any parting words of advice for, for the audience, and whether that be people who are trying to create something, uh, working as a team, uh, or just thoughts about what, you know, what comes next in the space, what would you, well, not what would you want to say? What would you like? To, what, 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 what will you, what will you say? <laughs> okay. So two things. One is um, just along the lines that you were, you were mentioning um, with regard to making information accessible. The other thing that we're, we're working on and others are working on is the um, application of uh, artificial intelligence to OCT uh, for image analysis and interpretation. And that is another way that um, we can kind of flatten the globe in terms of access to uh, essentially expert assessment because with the artificial intelligence, um, assuming that it can be developed to an adequate degree, you could have not just the OCT image, but the analysis of the OCT image at you know, an expert or even greater than an expert level for anybody who can acquire a decent uh, OCT. So um, I'm, I'm excited about that. The, you know, for, for people who are listening to the podcast who, you know, might be thinking about a, a career, uh, who uh, have an interest in almost anything. I mean, I, what I would say is, you know, it's important to stay curious and to not accept the status quo because, you know, it may be that things are as they are because that's the way they should be, but it may be because nobody's thought of a better way to do it, but there are better ways out there. And so, uh, you know, understanding the fundamentals, the mechanisms of how things work allows you to think more deeply um, and to be creative in understanding and in fire, finding new solutions. Because if you understand how something works or doesn't work, then you can think of a way to approach that thing in order to either modulate it, change it, make it better, uh, you know, cure the disease. And I think in the end, um, that's in medicine, that's, that's what we all are trying to do. How, do. how do we do a better job in, in taking care of patients? And part of that better job is making care accessible uh, to anybody who needs it. So, so yes, that is, that is part of the, uh, the responsibility of the clinician. And I, I take that responsibility really seriously. So it's, it's really been a pleasure speaking with you. I, I think that, um, yeah, it's been fun for me. I, I hope it has for you too. 
Oh, no, this is this is great. Uh, you know, if we didn't have a kind of a time limit on this conversation, I would probably try to keep you on for another two or three hours. I have a lot of questions, and uh, um, maybe at some point in the future we can do a round two. But uh, you know, for today, I think we'll. I think I've taken enough of your time. But uh, no, I truly appreciate you you um, you joining and sharing the stories and knowledge and and perspectives. I think it's uh, certainly something that I've enjoyed, and I think something that uh, the audience will enjoy. So thank you for your time. Great. Thanks so much. And that concludes today's episode of the Broad Eye Podcast. If you enjoyed this episode, please be sure to subscribe on your favorite podcast platform. Of course, ratings and reviews are always welcome. And you can certainly share this episode with any of your colleagues or friends who might enjoy it. Thanks for listening.